Here is a Logitech model X540 subwoofer with built-in amplifier. This is part of one of these surround sound computer speaker systems. This is a recent dump find. I didn't bother taking any of the satellite speakers because those were just made from plastic. Not very interesting at all. This one, however, I think is interesting enough for a teardown. Let's go and take a look around this thing. We do have a big base port on the front. The subwoofer itself is on the bottom of the unit. A nice big driver right here. And if you're living in a flat, your downstairs neighbors will love this. <laughs> Got two big screws, so I would expect that's where the transformer is mounted, so no switch mode power supply in this one, most likely. Nothing on the sides, nothing on the top. Here is the back. This is where it gets interesting. Now, up here we have a wired remote control, which uh, I can just bring into the shot. There it is, and I find these are typically the weak point in these systems. On this one, you have uh, volume, base volume, mute, matrix, whatever that does, and on the front, a headphone jack. And yeah, sign of uh, cost cutting. You know, these, these remotes used to be socketed, but not anymore, apparently. Now, as we take a look at the uh, connections right here, we have the inputs, front, rear, sub, and center. There are the speaker outputs, all RCA jacks, front, center, rear, and down here is a figure of eight power input. And then right here we have the power switch, which does have the standby symbol, on and standby, so we will see if this actually does cut power to the transformer or if it really is just standby. Feels kind of cheap, so maybe it only cuts the secondary side of the transformer, in which case it would kind of be a standby. But let's find out all about this thing. The first thing that I took out to make sure that it doesn't get damaged is the speaker chassis of the subwoofer. This is quite a decent little speaker, coated membrane, probably for protection, certainly for the looks of it. The surround is only made out of foam, so that won't last forever. So we take a look around, again, decent little speaker, this is metal. Magnet also has a decent size, I would say. Uh, no markings, just says Logitech and a part number, I guess. I measured the uh, voice coil. It's a 4 ohm speaker chassis. How many watts? I don't know. It doesn't say. So that's that. That's the first part that I'm going to keep. I took out all the screws of the electronics. I also had to go in through the speaker opening in the bottom and cut a cable tie. So now I can reveal what makes this thing work. And it is quite an interesting design, as you can see. It has this big heat sink that kind of uh, covers everything. It has a hole for the filter capacitor. That's a little funny. Also, there is a cutout in the uh, in the opening in the case for the uh, capacitor to fit through. I can already see two big ICs, but to see even more, I'll have to remove this heatsink. And finally, here is the main board, all taken apart so that we can take a closer look at it. Taking off the heatsink wasn't too difficult, but taking off the plastic in the back, that took a lot of brute force because it was all glued together to make it airtight. So, yeah, that's a little bit broken now, but no problem, because now we can finally see what's going on here.
So uh, the transformer delivers about 14 volts into this board. We have a 5 ampere fuse right there. And then a nice beefy rectifier bridge made up from 1N5401 diodes. There is the main filter capacitor, 6800 microfarads at 25 volts. There is uh, 17 volts present right here, so that's what supplies this board. That's the main supply voltage. As you can see, disappointingly, this is a dual layer board. Here is the underside, not much going on here. Got a ground plane, there is the star-shaped ground point at the main filter capacitor. Most of the stuff is on top, plenty of surface mount components, so it is a little bit difficult to tell what is what, and so, yeah, we have 17 volts right there, but if there is some, uh, some other circuitry that generates other voltages, I don't know. I can't tell. Let's uh, now follow the signal path through this board. So the inputs are right here, and those presumably run to over here. Now these two chips, these are probably the most interesting chips in this circuit, and very frustratingly, I don't know what they do. Uh, you can find them online if you search for R2S15201. You can buy them, but there are no data sheets available on these. So I'm pretty sure these are some custom circuits that uh, were produced by Renesis for Logitech. I'd say they do some sort of signal processing probably analog, maybe digital. I, I can't believe it would be digital signal processing in these. These are too simple for that. So some sort of signal processing controlled by the remote control, which connects up here. Now the signal then travels on. We have uh, some uh, small surface mount chips up here. There are three JRC 2060 chips. These are quad operational amplifiers, three of them. And then right here we have some tiny little 8-pin surface mount chips. And these are some high-performance analog switches made by Renesis. And these are obviously there for some sort of analog signal switching. So that's this portion, basically. And then we have the most interesting components on this board right here. These are two STA540 quad amplifier chips, four-channel amplifiers made by ST. Now, for this 5.1 surround sound system, of course, we only need six channels. We have a total of eight channels here. So what they've done is the front left and right and rear left and right are ran independently from these uh, two chips, two independent channels. And then the other two channels for center and subwoofer have been bridged together. So these are now three channel amplifier chips. And they are quite uh, capable little amplifier chips. Very, very simple circuitry. So I will definitely try to get these out of this uh, circuit board. That's going to be a real challenge with these uh, double-sided boards. And here is what's inside the wired remote control. And when I opened this thing, it somehow smelled of wine. Now, there isn't any residue to be seen, but it definitely smelled of wine. So that might be the reason why this whole thing ended up at the dump. And it also confirms what I said earlier on, these remote controls are the weak point. 
<laughs> so uh, this thing is really simple and it also confirms my theory of the mystery chips on the main board doing some sort of signal processing. Because the only audio signals that come into this remote are the ones going to the headphone jack. And you can tell there are some really beefy traces. Everything else is just really thin. So the way this works is with control voltages. So for the volume controls, we have two traditional potentiometers, but those don't actually set audio levels themselves. These generate a control voltage, and the mystery chips on the main board will set the volume for the entire system depending on that control voltage. Same thing for these two switches. Now, uh, this labeling right here is a little funny. It says Eagle Puck. Did they really call this shitty little remote control the Eagle Puck? Oh dear. We do have a date, and if I'm reading this correctly, this was designed in 2011. This is a nice transformer. Fist for scale. And this is a keeper. The power switch was actually switching the primary side of the transformer, so it is a real power switch not a standby switch, despite feeling cheap. Now this has so much glue all over it, I don't think that can be salvaged. To summarize this video, let's take a look at all the components that I have salvaged. We have the transformer, the speaker. It would have been rude not to take those two green 3mm LEDs off the remote control circuit board. And then, well, as you can see, I didn't salvage much from the main board. Simple reason, it is a double layer board with plated through contacts, and it's incredibly difficult to unsolder anything from such boards because the plated through contact connecting through to the other layer, this whole setup acts as a heat sink. And if I use my desoldering gun to desolder, to try and desolder components, what happens is the heatsink takes all the heat out of the tip and, well, you can't get the component out. So what I ended up doing to unsolder these components up here is I use both the desoldering gun and the soldering iron to uh, simultaneously heat up a solder joint. That worked relatively well. Now for these components, these two being the most important ones, I had to use a method that I really don't enjoy using. See, I don't have a hot air rework station yet. It's, it's on the to-do list. It, I'm going to buy one eventually. But for right now, all I had was... Uh, this giant big 1800 watt heat gun and I use that at maximum power which uh, the gun says it puts out 600 degrees Celsius so that's way too much. I did do some tests before unsoldering these uh, important chips. One of the tests was this little capacitor and I put it on the tester and it actually survived. So, well, that can stay. But then for these two chips, I wanted to play safe. So before uh, heating them with a heat gun, I attached this uh, heat sink to each one of the chips. So that took some of the heat out of the chip that uh, came up through the leads. And then once the chip had been freed up from the board, I immediately uh, you know, touched the leads onto a cold surface so that the leads could also act as a heat sink. So I hope these uh, chips have survived because previously when I unsoldered chips using the big heat gun, they didn't survive that. But we'll find out about that in a future video. For right now, I'd like to say Thank you for watching.